Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Lindsay Montanari. I lead the academic program here at Garobi Optimization. Thanks so much for joining us for this webinar on analytics for a better world. Before we dive in, I just wanted to cover a few logistics points. So if you have a question, please feel free to ask it at any point during the webinar. We are going to use the Q&A feature, so that's at the bottom of your screen. We're going to save about 10 minutes at the end of the session for Q&A live with Dr. Dickton Hertog. Today's webinar is the fifth of a new series in 2022, shining the spotlight on the academic community and its innovative approaches to problem solving. Today, we're thrilled to welcome Professor Dickton Hertog. Dick is a professor of operations research at the University of Amsterdam. His research interests cover various fields of prescriptive analytics, in particular, linear and nonlinear optimization. In recent years, his main focus has been on robust optimization, and he recently started research on optimization with machine learning. He's also active in applying theory to real life applications. In particular, he's interested in applications that contribute to a better society, as you're going to learn today. Professor Den Hertog received the INFORMS Franz Edelman Award twice, first in 2013 for his research on optimal flood protection, and again in 2022 for his research on optimizing the food supply chain for the UN's World Food Program. Dick is also the Science to Impact Director of Analytics for a Better World, which he co-founded in 2022. Thanks so much, Dick. Over to you for your session. Thanks a lot, uh, Lindsay, for the very kind uh, introduction. And uh, good morning or good afternoon, it depends where you are. Um, so um, thanks for inviting me to give this uh, presentation, which is uh, about analytics for a better world. Um, indeed, so Lindsay already said it, so I'm the science um, uh, to impact director. Um, I'm maybe the only person in the world with this uh, title, um, but you know, it's really on purpose um, because what I uh, do for the Analytics for the Better World um, Institute is really meant for impact. So impact is really an uh, important uh, goal there to really have impact. Um, so Analytics for the Better World, um, it's about um, uh, applications for the um, sustainable development uh, goals. Um, and first, what I would like to do is just um, to describe three books that were very inspiring for me. Uh, and also books that influence me a lot uh, for doing this type of applications. And the first book that influenced me a lot um, is the book uh, by uh, Harry Lewis, Excellence Without a Soul. Um, so um, Harry is a uh, former dean of Harvard uh, College. And in his book, he is in fact uh, arguing that young people should be more challenged on purpose and meaning. And um, from that uh, time on, I started to do societal relevant uh, projects and also to include those applications in my uh, teaching. The second book that uh, influenced me a lot um, was Weapons of Mass Destruction, written by Katie O'Neill. I think it's, an, uh, it's an, a good book, um, but it's just one side of the, of the coin. And I think the other side of the book is not well treated in this book. Or... It's only in the last chapter, and uh, most of the people only uh, get to half of the book and not to the end of the book. So um, I think um, there's also another side, namely a positive side. And uh, I would also like to um, describe two of such applications in my presentation. So when I read that uh, book, um, Weapons of Math Destruction, uh, Kate Suenel is using uh, WMD. Um, I coined the term analytics for the better world abbreviated by ABW. And the last uh, book that influenced me uh, a lot is uh, Factfulness of Hans uh, Rosling. Um, and that is, uh, book is in fact about, um, yeah, if you look at the facts, if you look at the statistics, or if you look at the descriptive uh, analytics, uh, then the state of the world is maybe much more positive than people think. Of course, I agree that nowadays we have serious issues now, but still, I think um, there are many positive uh, trends, and uh, this book is, um, uh, in fact, describing them. And um, yeah, that gives me also um, hope and also energy to continue and to also use analytics to improve this world a little bit. And finally, to uh, uh, colleagues that influenced me uh, a lot. 
uh, Dimitri Betsimas from MIT and Hein Fleur from Tilburg Universities. I think uh, those two are uh, uh, among the best uh, optimizers, applied optimizers in, in the world, and they influence me uh, a lot. Okay, so in fact, uh, the talk of today is about analytics, more specifically prescriptive analytics, uh, optimization for um, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Um, I think um, those Sustainable Development Goals need no introduction. I'm sure you all, you, uh, you all know them. Um, and today the applications is more on uh, uh, zero hunger and on the third one, good health and well-being. So that is the content of my talk. First, I would like to describe two applications. One is about uh, optimizing food supply chain, uh, and that's with the World Food Programme. And the second uh, one is on optimizing uh, locations of hospitals in Timor-Leste and Vietnam. And that's together with the World Bank. And so then in the end, I would like to uh, uh, say a few words about the uh, analytics for the Better World Institute. So let's uh, me start with uh, optimizing food supply chain of the World Food Programme. So again, together with the World Food Programme, um, and that is uh, on the second SDG, zero hunger. So an acknowledgement, so many of the slides are from uh, Hein Fleuren and Koen Peters. So in fact, uh, Lindsay already um, uh, told you that we won the Edelman Award um, for this in 2021. Um, so here you see the team uh, that won the, the award. And I would like to um, highlight two names who um, did um, most of the work. Uh, Koen Peters from uh, World Food Programme and uh, Hein Fleuren from Tilburg University. So uh, Hein uh, led the project uh, at Tilburg University. I was also working at that time at Tilburg University. And uh, Koen Peters uh, is the head of the group of people uh, that were working on it uh, from the World Food Programme. Okay, so first I would like to uh, give a short introduction to the World Food Programme. Um, and uh, uh, then describe, in fact, the, um, the application and the model that we uh, implemented. So this is uh, the hunger uh, map of uh, 2020, um, and it uh, illustrates where in the world there is hunger. So the colors indicate how severe uh, the hunger is, chronic uh, hunger. Um, so um, typically here in Africa and in these countries here, there is uh, hunger. So, for example, the yellow color is uh, means that five to uh, fifteen percent of the people of that country um, they uh, really suffer from uh, undernourishment, and this is uh, from uh, the years two thousand seventeen to two thousand nineteen. Typically, what you'll see is that the World Food Program is active in these uh, these countries uh, here. Okay. Uh, that in fact, um, in the world, there is enough food. Um, there's only a transportation uh, an, a problem. Um, so in about uh, 820 million uh, people, they suffer from uh, hunger. And the World Food Program is, in fact, supporting 10% of them. Um, so 80 million people. And every uh, year, they ship 4 million metric tons um, uh, every year. So that's um, really uh, a lot. Um, so my colleague Fleure is uh, using the following um, story to illustrate that. So suppose that you have a line of, uh, of trucks from Amsterdam to Rome. And Rome is the headquarters of the World Food Program. And back the line back to Amsterdam and again from Amsterdam to Rome. So Amsterdam, Rome, back Amsterdam, and then again to Rome. And those trucks are full of food. So that is, um, um, that is approximately the amount of uh, food that is uh, shipped every year by the World Food Program. And then I always add an, uh, an, more than an, uh, an American version for the American people who are maybe not aware of the distances in, the, in, in Europe. So um, if you have a line of uh, trucks from Boston to Chicago and back to uh, Boston and then again to Chicago, um, and those trucks are full of uh, food, 
that is approximately the amount of food that is transported by the World Food Program. Okay, so um, I would like now to um, um, give you an introduction to World Food Program. I will use the, the video that was made for the Edelman Award, and I will show you the first minutes to introduce the World Food Program. In 2019, nearly 690 million people regularly went to bed hungry. One in 11 people did not have access to enough food. Two billion people cannot afford a nutritious diet. Today, because of COVID, these figures are even higher. Conflict, climate change and COVID-19 have created the greatest humanitarian challenge since the Second World War. A record 235 million people will need humanitarian assistance and protection in 2021. A near 40% increase on 2020, which is almost entirely due to the compounding effects of COVID-19. One of the agencies responding to these humanitarian needs is the United Nations World Food Programme, WFP. When it comes to delivering food assistance in emergencies, improving nutrition and building resilience in communities, WFP leads the way, saving lives and changing lives. For its efforts to combat hunger, for its contribution to bettering conditions for peace in conflict affected areas, and for acting as a driving force in efforts to prevent the use of hunger as a weapon of war and conflict, WFP was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2020. To assist nearly 100 million people in over 80 countries, WFP operates over 5,000 trucks, 30 ships and nearly 100 planes every day. Delivering food and other assistance to those in most need, wherever they are. In 2020, WFP transferred more than 4 million metric tons of food and 2 billion US dollars in cash-based transfers to beneficiaries. was the introduction to uh, the World Food Program. Um, so in fact, um, the model that was uh, uh, built for that um, was in fact for the, for the following. So the, the basic questions that had, to be the, that had to be answered there is the following. So where, where to, to purchase the ingredients of uh, the daily meal? So suppose that there is hunger in a certain area and we would like to provide food to those people. Then the first question is, what should be the ingredients of the daily meal? What should be added to the daily meal? Should it be oil, beans, rice, and how much? And it should be such that, um, of course, all kinds of nutritional requirements are satisfied. But also the questions, where to purchase those ingredients? Um, and such that, in fact, the total cost of purchasing cost and transportation cost is minimized. So those two problems are put together uh, in, in, in the model. So it is basically a an, an, an multi-commodity mean cost flow problem and a an diet uh, model. So again, the questions are, what should be the daily meal? Which ingredients? How much? Where to purchase them? How to transport them to the people that are in need? Such that the total costs are minimized and the nutritional requirements are satisfied. And nutritional requirements, for example, so much fat, so much vitamin, so much, uh, so much calories, and so on. So basically, that is a combination of the multi-commodity cost flow problem and the, uh, the diet uh, model. So that's, in fact, uh, um, and the first application. Uh, one of the first applications was in, in, in Syria. Um, so in Syria, you have at uh, that time a beneficiary uh, camps. Um, and the question is, what should be the, the daily meal uh, uh, there? What should be the ingredients? Um, where to purchase them? How to transport them? Uh, for example, uh, via which uh, harbors, um, to which uh, warehouses, and finally uh, to the uh, beneficiary uh, camps. 
So that is in fact the um, total problem that has to be uh, solved. And so in fact, um, a um, mixed integer uh, linear programming um, model was um, developed uh, for that. Um, and I would like to describe it um, here. So it's a very simplified um, model that was built uh, for that. Um, and I only showed a simplified model here, um, but I think it's good to, uh, to uh, discuss it. So in all, we have a, a set of nodes, suppliers, ports, warehouses, beneficiary camps. We have a set of commodities, yeah, the ingredients. We have a set of uh, nutrients, uh, fat, vitamin, uh, and so on. We have parameters for the number of beneficiaries. Um, we have parameters for the uh, cost of handling, for purchasing costs, for transportation costs, for nutritional requirements. We have parameters for the nutritional value for each ingredient. And we have flow variables. So FIJK is an important variable. Uh, that's the amount in kilogram of commodity K uh, that's sent from node I to node J. And RK is the uh, Russian size. So the amount uh, in the daily uh, uh, meal of commodity uh, K. So this is the simplified uh, model um, that we also uh, show to uh, the students in different, um, in different uh, courses. Um, even in the first course on optimization, uh, we use this, uh, uh, this uh, model to illustrate the value of uh, uh, optimization. So this is then uh, the uh, simplified uh, uh, model. Um, so the objective minimize the total costs. So here are the purchasing cost, the transportation uh, cost, and the handling cost. And of course, we have constraints. Eh? Flow uh, should be preserved. So flow in is flow out for each commodity. Um, of course, all the beneficiaries should receive a food basket. So the flow into a beneficiary camp should be at least uh, the number of people there times what is needed um, per day. And we have the diet constraints, the nutritional requirements, uh, namely that if you look at the, the ration and you multiply that with the uh, uh, amount of uh, uh, nutrients that is in that ingredient, that should be, and we sum over all the commodities, all the ingredients, that should be at least the required nutritional value. So these are typically the diet uh, constraints. So this is the core basic uh, uh, model that is uh, used. Um, of course, um, there are many more um, aspects that should be taken uh, into account. So there are extensions to this simplified uh, model, um, have, for example, multi-period, uh, seasonal prices, we have different beneficiary types, so the requirements for children and for uh, adults or uh, pregnant women are different. So a uh, distinction is made uh, for that. We should take into account um, all aspects of um, um, uh, vouchers that we can give. And we have restrictions for donor. Um, for example, palatability restrictions. That the effect ingredients of the daily meal should be such that uh, yeah, it is also uh, palatable. Um, so there are some restrictions that, for example, the total amount of pulses and vegetables should be between a minimum and a maximum uh, amount. So all kinds of restrictions that makes the uh, daily meal uh, palatable. So that is the, 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 the mixed integer, uh, the, the linear optimization model that we used. And um, so WFP, the group of... Um, uh, the, the group at uh, WFP, they built an, a software tool, Optimus, uh, for that. Um, and uh, well, uh, they use a lot of data, a lot of input data, shipping data, transport data, warehousing data, and so on. So much time is uh, spent on collecting uh, that data. In fact, I described the model, but uh, maybe the development of the model is just uh, the easiest part. And also uh, uh, the part that cost uh, the least amount of, uh, of time, um, but collecting the data, that is really uh, a uh, very time consuming um, activity. So um, that's then uh, Optimus is uh, then used and then optimal plan is generated and analyzed. 
Okay, so um, the first this was um, applied to uh, uh, Iraq um, in 2015, and uh, at that time we found uh, they found a new food basket, and that has in almost the same uh, nutritional value, but the cost savings were 17 percent. So that uh, means, in fact, that was uh, more than one million dollar per month. Or to put it differently, you can then in fact, feed more people, and in this case, 85,000 more people. We also applied it to, uh, uh, to Syria um, after that. And there again, um, there was a solution uh, found and, 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 and accepted finally that has a cost saving of 26% uh, of the cost, which is in fact in equivalent with feeding 1 million more people. So now it's, um, the World Food Program is uh, using it in, uh, uh, practically speaking, all their uh, new operations. Uh, but these were the first uh, applications for the World Food Program. So what I would like to uh, show you now is another part of the video. Um, and, and that is about the application in in 2019, nearly six. Implementing an optimal corridor allocation. Air deliveries cost up to seven times as much as road or river deliveries. We therefore use airdrops only as a last resort when security or poor infrastructure hinder our access. Using the data and visibility approach described by my colleague earlier, we combine various data sets including geospatial data, road networks and the usability throughout different seasons, weather patterns, food assistance requirements, population movements, security and access constraints, and river navigability. We then analyze this data, visualize it to facilitate discussion and determine the operational plan that tells us the timing, the quantity, the commodity, the delivery modality, and the location. This innovative approach not only ensures that our beneficiaries receive a full food basket without this year, even when the commercial sector stops, but has also had airdrop since 2018. Given the operational plan for downstream deliveries, we determine the optimal upstream plan. To do this, we use Optimus. We feed it with food requirements from the downstream operational plan, supply chain costs, food supply availability and donor constraints amongst others. From this, we derive the optimal sourcing and delivery plan that helps us understand how much food has to be bought, where and when, and the corridors we will use to deliver. In conclusion, here in South Sudan, analytics help us to improve our operations and better help the people we serve. It has enabled us to save lives, save costs, open up new transport options, and engage better with our donors. When we are talking about logistics in South Sudan, we have to beat the challenge. Okay, so that was about the application in uh, Sudan. So um, if you would like to uh, read more about this, so we uh, wrote uh, two uh, papers on it. Um, they were here. And if you would like to see the full um, video, this is the link to the video. So this is the first application. So I would like now to um, uh, start with the second application. Um, so the first one was uh, already for us and, and, and uh, um, uh, the, the application was already uh, several years ago. And this application is uh, a more recent application. And uh, that is uh, about, um, optimizing the geospatial accessibility for healthcare. Uh, and in this case, it was for Timor-Leste, a country uh, close to Indonesia. And it was about optimization of locations for the hospitals. So that has to do with the third SDG. And it was together with the um, World Bank. And again, you know, um, it was a, a joint effort of, an, of a team. Um, and um, especially, I would also like to mention the, the name of uh, Pavati uh, Krishna, um, who has done a lot in this uh, respect. 
um, and also people from uh, um, Tilburg University um, are involved uh, in that. Okay, so uh, Timor Leste is a uh, small uh, uh, country uh, close to uh, Indonesia. Uh, it's a poor country. It uh, became independent in 2002 after a war, uh, 1.3 million people. Um, and the World Bank is uh, helping them by providing uh, loans uh, such that the infrastructure uh, can be improved and specifically also for healthcare. And access, accessibility to healthcare is very important there because research has shown that there is a direct link between the distance uh, the patients uh, Pointer. The patients has to uh, travel uh, and the reduction of illness and suffering in the country. So, in fact, if health facilities, if hospitals or primary uh, care centers are located close to patients instead of far away, then um, they tend to use uh, they tend to use them more. So, this is uh, the distance to um, hospitals to uh, healthcare centers is very important, um, especially for third world countries. Uh, so in Timor Leste, in fact, uh, if you do the analysis, then uh, one fourth of the, the people are more than two hours uh, walking distance from uh, two hours walk from their nearest primary facility. You also see the infrastructure, some pictures here of, of roads. Um, so, you know, it's uh, not that what we are uh, accustomed to in the uh, in our countries. And so, and that was in fact uh, uh, the final goal. So, um, also one of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals is that, um, for example, 95% of the population um, should get access to primary health care uh, centers within five kilometers distance. So, here you see uh, Timor Leste. Um, the red dots are the current uh, healthcare centers, the primary healthcare centers. And uh, the question was, okay, so how much percentage of the people um, does have access to such a center? And um, where should new centers be located such that um, we get a situation where at least 95% of the people have access to an, uh, such a healthcare center? So uh, we used a lot of uh, data for this uh, for this uh, model that we uh, developed. Um, data about the current uh, facilities, the current uh, centers, but also uh, potential uh, locations of centers. Uh, of course, a uh, lot of uh, much data about road networks, about the population, about um, all kinds of um, um, data about uh, floods and rain and we integrated the data into uh, the model. So the road networks was already a an, an problem um, because um, there is no um, digital road network in which all the roads are uh, uh, available. So in fact, what we did there is um, there were two road networks, digital road networks, um, and they were overlapping, um, but we uh, combined them into one new road network uh, and so by combining them you know um, yeah the the new road network was much richer than uh, each of them separately but it was not uh, easy so we built also and uh, developed also an algorithm to do that because in this two roadmaps if there were roads that were uh, the same then sometimes they have different coordinates uh, but it's the same road. So how to decide whether they are the same roads or not? So uh, we developed a um, method for that. In fact, uh, PhD students at Stilburg University, Valentine Stine, and we wrote a paper on that. And we use this for uh, Timor Leste. So basically, the, if you look at the model, uh, it's an uncapacitated facility uh, location um, model. Um, yeah, so where to put where to have the new centers such that 95% of the people have a, an, a center closer than five kilometers, for example. And um, we built a mixed integer clean optimization model uh, for that. 
and uh, used uh, uh, Kodobi to solve that. So for Timor Leste, we had uh, 15,000 possible locations um, for the center and 40,000 household locations. Um, so it's a small country, but you know this problem is already uh, big. And later we also did it for uh, other countries in Vietnam, and there we even had uh, much bigger um, problems. And the time it uh, took to get a solution was uh, one uh, one minute. Of course, I can't uh, resist the temptation to show you uh, the model. Um, so this is the, the model, but I think it's a uh, well-known model, but I will uh, I will show you. So we have, of course, a set for the for the households, for the possible uh, hospital locations. And we assume that uh, we already have some existing ones. And so the first one to M um, are the existing uh, ones. We have a parameter VI, and that's the number of people um, in the household or the cluster of house household uh, location I, travel distance between household I and hospital J. We have S is the maximal travel distance. Uh, so say five kilometers. And P is the number of additional hospitals that we can uh, add. We have variables X, J, binary. It's one if hospital location, hospital at home location J is opened and zero otherwise. And ZI, also a binary variable, and that's one if household I is served or a cluster of house, household uh, I is served by at least one hospital. So, and this is the, the model, uh, maybe you, uh, you know it. So this is a model that um, really tries to avoid that we have double indices um, uh, such that we can solve large scale problems like uh, this one. So we maximize the total number of household that are of the number of people that are uh, that has a, a center within uh, the s kilometers so set i is if the household is um, uh, covered by a center vi is the number of people living there so this is the total number of people that live uh, that has a center uh, closer uh, than s kilometers say five kilometers so XJ is one. So for those locations where we already have a uh, center, so we put that uh, uh, variable equal to one. And the total number of new facilities that we can place is uh, at most P. So we sum of XJ is P. And this is then the constraint that says that um, if a household is connected, no, a household is connected if at least one of the uh, facilities closer than S kilometers is opened. And so if one of those XDA is one, then ZI can also become one. So only if one of the facilities of the centers closer than S kilometers is opened. And the variables are binary variables. So we solve this uh, mixed integer um, um, optimization problem with uh, Kodobi. Um, here's some results if we only restrict ourselves to one district, uh, Mira. Um, so this is done then the current situation. Um, so the green ones are the current primary healthcare centers, and the green dots are the households that are closer than five uh, kilometers, and the red ones are the ones that are not covered, so they are further away than five kilometers. And if you then add optimally um, 10 facilities, then you can increase this percentage from 63 to 81%. And this is then the result. But of course, you know, it's uh, not good to do that um, for each um, district separately. So we did it for the full country. And this is then also an important uh, um, curve. So the existing facilities was in total 139 facilities. Uh, and so we added one facility, two, three, four, five, and so on, and then optimized. And here you see, in fact, the uh, coverage, the percentage of people that can be covered. And so for the current situation with the 139 facilities, the coverage was 61%. And uh, here you see the coverage 
um, the coverage if you add facilities. And to arrive at 95%, you have to add, um, what is it, 40, um, around 40 new facilities. We also looked at the green field situation. Suppose that we uh, neglect the existing ones and just uh, start from uh, scratch. Then you see that you can already arrive at the 61% uh, by uh, 16 facilities and the 95% uh, is then uh, already arrived uh, by uh, 80. So this type of uh, um, curves gives uh, a lot of insights to uh, uh, those who have to decide. So it was also uh, the results were also discussed with the uh, people. So you see a big investment area for one of the uh, primary uh, healthcare uh, centers. And um, uh, Timor Leste government, uh, together with the World Bank, they also uh, wrote a uh, report uh, on this. Um, and the policies described in that report were based on the, the outcomes of our uh, model. This is the cover of the report. Um, so this is a thanks to our sponsor. So uh, Kodobi is sponsor of the um, Analytics for the Better World Institute, and they also uh, we uh, also used Kodobi for this application in Timor Leste. So that was in the Timor Leste, but we realized after this uh, project that you know there were. Uh, many more countries uh, that have the same type of uh, uh, questions. Um, so we built an, an, a toolbox um, such that we can also uh, apply those methods to other countries and to other applications. So I would, do, would like to describe uh, that. So we also extended uh, the toolbox to the situation where um, the roads are, are uh, flooded because of uh, rain, for example. And um, we have to decide, for example, um, if you have money to upgrade the roads such that floods are in effect um, uh, prevented. Um, then the question is, which roads should be upgraded uh, such that the benefits in terms of accessibility to hospitals is maximized um, so we also uh, built a model to be able to uh, decide on that. We also applied in uh, Vietnam. Uh, there it was about uh, the location of uh, stroke centers. It is very important um, uh, to have a stroke center close by because if you have a stroke, you really have to be, go to fast to the um, um, to a stroke center. Uh, and in Vietnam, stroke is an, uh, really uh, yeah, an important uh, cause of death there. Uh, it's number one effect. So uh, there the question was, what should be the uh, locations, optimal locations of uh, additional stroke centers? So here you see a picture of a part of uh, Vietnam with the current uh, stroke centers. But we uh, uh, also found new locations for the additional stroke centers. We also uh, expanded that uh, to the question, if you have, if you would like to uh, increase the capacity of the stroke centers in terms of uh, beds, and suppose that you have a number of uh, beds, a budget of beds, where to add beds in which stroke centers such that the, the, the benefit is the highest. We also applied the toolbox in uh, Nepal for the optimal uh, locations of uh, COVID test uh, centers in uh, Armenia, hospital locations. Um, so we built a um, toolbox for that. It's called a uh, special planning and budgeting uh, platform. Um, and of course, this model is included uh, in that, but not only that, there's a lot of uh, visualization in it. And this is one of the screens, so you can uh, really uh, dive into uh, all kinds of statistics, but also the locations and zoom in what the location is exactly uh, there. Um, and um, that toolbox is now uh, used in all those applications that uh, I described before. Okay, so this is about the, uh, the second uh, application um, where we um, uh, built a mixed integer um, 
model and solve that. And that was the uh, optimization of healthcare accessibility. And especially in uh, uh, Timor Leste, Vietnam. Finally, what I would like uh, to do is um, to describe um, the analytics for the Better World uh, Institute. So that's a uh, research institute that we started in, uh, in uh, January. Um, and I would like to uh, describe the vision, what's behind it, and uh, the type of projects that we are uh, doing there. So Analytics for the Better World um, Institute is uh, founded by the University of Amsterdam and also uh, by, the, by the company Ortec. Ortec is a uh, big operation research uh, company in, uh, in the Netherlands. And so these uh, partners founded this Analytics for the Better World Institute and also uh, with the help of uh, Professor Betsy Mas from MIT. If you would like to read more about the Institute, this is the website, analyticsbetterworld.org. So the vision is in fact the following. So analytics nowadays is very important for, uh, for companies used a lot, um, great value. Um, we think that analytics also has the same potential to uh, contribute to the sustainable development goals, to the uh, humanitarian and societal challenges. So that's in fact the dream that we would like to, uh, to do in this institute is to apply analytics to contribute to the um, sustainable development goals. So we are aiming on the sustainable development goals I already showed you before. And these are the activities that we do in the institute. So um, of course, uh, we have the projects. Um, I, uh, I discussed... Uh, the, for example, the project for the Timor Leste and, and, and Vietnam and so on. Um, so projects is important, um, but we also have an academy. So we also have educational programs for um, employees of NGOs to also train them, to also educate them in uh, analytics. So we would like to avoid the situation where we just do a project and we run away. No, we also would like to educate uh, those people such that they are maybe also uh, um, able to do those projects uh, them, themselves, finally. Um, we organize uh, meetups. So every two months we have an, uh, an, uh, an webinar where we, did, where we discuss uh, one or more uh, applications. Of course, we do uh, research if we need other methods so it's also nice to see that uh, many projects that we do in this institute, we also um, see that um, yeah, the existing methods and tools and techniques are um, not always uh, there already. So we have to develop uh, new methods, or do new research to find more efficient uh, methods or models. We also start to... Uh, 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 new uh, journal where the focus is not on uh, theoretical and innovative new uh, theory, but more on um, those projects that are um, impactful. And we also built a um, repository where we put all the tools and techniques that we develop uh, open source, such that it can also be used by other uh, NCOs in other applications. So here are some examples of uh, partners for which uh, we do uh, projects. Um, so uh, AMREF is one of the partners, the Red Cross, the World Bank, we already have seen an, uh, an uh, application for that, World Health Organization, World Food Program, Ocean Cleanup uh, is also an, an partner and it has to do with these uh, SDGs. Um, yeah, so um, the setup of the institute is also as follows. So uh, we also invite um, uh, companies to sponsor um, to sponsor the, the institute by providing, uh, for example, also uh, in kind. Uh, so we are also very um, far in the process for a uh, partnership with uh, the DHL and. Um, so they will also um, uh, going to sponsor us and they are also uh, 
providing us with um, um, their with employees with capacity and they're contributing um, for example in the academy but also in uh, in projects so finally what i uh, uh, would like to do i can't um, resist the temptation to show you uh, another application that we are currently working on uh, and that's for the ocean cleanup um for the ocean cleanup, uh, there the problem is as follows. So the ocean cleanup is a company, a Dutch company, who tries to uh, remove the plastic from the uh, the oceans. There are five uh, hotspots uh, in the oceans on plastic, and they have uh, this type of uh, systems to uh, collect uh, plastic. So this uh, these boats are uh, sailing in that direction with uh, slow speed. Uh, and then the plastic is collected in this uh, system here, and that is emptied then, let's say every five days or so. Um, the ocean cleanup, they also have predictions about um, the plastic density in uh, different locations of the, uh, of the ocean. And then the question is how to steer the boats in such a way that we collect the most amount uh, the maximum amount of, of plastic during uh, a certain amount of time. So that's in fact a problem uh, that we try to solve. So this problem is still going on, but we already uh, developed a method uh, for that. So what you see here is um, a map of a part of the ocean. So this is in kilometers, kilometers. And um, you see for each pixel here, uh, which is, I think, uh, uh, 10 by 10 kilometers, you see a prediction of the, of the plastic. So the lighter the color, um, the higher the density is. And so the red one is really the, the, the highest uh, uh, density. Um, but you know, this is moving eh, because we have waves and uh, tides and so on. So um, you see the, the time is running. Um, but also the, the, the plastic is moving. So we have also to take uh, that into account. We have to take into account um, high waves. So if the waves are too high, then it's not possible uh, um, to, uh, it's not safe to be there. And here you see the optimal uh, path. Um, so you see it goes on the, the light color, so to say. So like, uh, like the game Pac-Man, maybe you, uh, you know that game, that try to catch the most amount of plastic during a certain amount of uh, of time. So I'm really very thankful because uh, this uh, was done and developed by uh, Jean Pauvillet and uh, by Zi Song from the London Business School. So that's also what we are doing at the Analytics for the Better World Institute. We work together with uh, companies who are supporting us, um, uh, but also um, uh, working together uh, with uh, colleague. Uh, researchers also uh, for example in this case from london business school who are carrying out these uh, these uh, projects uh, for us okay so by the way yeah i am very uh, excited about this picture uh, but i showed my wife but she was saying well uh, uh, so what uh, <laughs> uh, but you know uh, this is i think very interesting and uh, also if you compare um, our solution and uh, um, uh, let's say the way they were doing it at uh, the company, uh, then it seems, but we have to be careful there, that uh, uh, we can collect uh, more than twice as much amount of plastic than they were able to it before. Right, so that's my, uh, my presentation. Um, so I think I now uh, hand over to uh, Lindsay. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of the attendees for joining us today. It's a very fascinating webinar. Before we shift to Q&A, I did want to just very quickly talk a little bit about our academic program here at Gorobi. So the program's mission is to truly help democratize the knowledge of mathematical optimization. And we're doing that through creating new applied resources, educational resources, and content like today's webinar. I also wanted to let the attendees here know about some special free opportunities for academics. We've always been huge supporters of academia here at Groby, and we're continuing to develop new resources and support the community. Here are just a few ways to support or that, that we support and we can partner with academics, students and faculty. So first, Groby licenses are always free for academics and recent graduates. 
please be sure to visit the website and to register to get started with your free license if you haven't already done so. Second, our optimization experts are available to support folks in the classroom. We do that through a series of guest lectures and workshop opportunities. And if you're interested in having Garobi team members in the classroom, please reach out to me. My email address is academicprogram at garobi.com. And then finally, we want to spread the word about the innovative projects that you in the academic community are working on with Garobi. So if you have an example or an exciting use case that you've developed that you'd like to share, or if you'd like to speak at one of our events, you can reach out to me and we can start that conversation. So these are just some of the ways that Garobi works to support the academic community, but I also wanted to note that you can connect with one another directly as well. We've got an active community page on our website where you can interact with users, you can ask questions if you're stuck with a particular feature or you have questions about your specific model, and you can have a direct line to other Garobi users and also members of the Garobi expert team. So you can think of that page as Garobi's own Stack Overflow. Uh, please visit the community page if you're interested in that and you want to get started connecting with other users, and you can do that by visiting support.garobi.com and clicking the community button. Okay, so now for the exciting stuff, we have time for about 10 minutes of questions with Professor Den Hertog. Please use the Q&A feature. I see that we've already got quite a few questions that have trickled in, and please continue to ask. We're going to try to get to everything today. Uh, Dick, can you see the questions? Yes, I can uh, see them. Okay, over to you. Um, great. Uh, let me see. Um, let me start. Um, the question is, am I correct in understanding that Timor Leste currently serves about 60% of its population, population using um, more than 100 locations, when it could be doing the same with 10 locations if optimally located from scratch? Uh, yes, that is uh, correct. Um, yeah, so it's currently serving 60%, um, 63%. Uh, um, in fact, um they are serving more but uh 60 percent or 63 percent of the population is within five uh, kilometers and indeed that can also be done by less than 10. Uh, um no i think it was 18 location but i i forgot uh but indeed uh many um i can look it up no i think it, it was something like 18 uh, locations uh, but of course, then, um, uh, since we look at uncapacitated uh, uh, formulation, then of course the capacity uh, becomes an issue. Uh, and that's certainly also, I think, what you would like to do in the future to look at capacitated versions of this model. But that's much more uh, uh, difficult, and especially for these large scale uh, applications. Um, Okay, so there's also a question. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Is there optimization training in Kurobi before buying the, the, the license? So I think, uh, Lindsay, you will um, um, answer those questions later, I think. Yeah, okay. Will, absolutely, I'll answer those to follow. Yeah. Okay, is there a link for the uh, GPPP uh, platform? Yes, so if you go to the uh, Analytics for the Better World um, uh, website, then uh, there you can find a link to the uh, uh, GPPP uh, platform. And then I go uh, up. Um, World Food Program is uh, perishability of food. Oh, no. um, a factor you consider? Um, if yes, uh, how? Um, yeah, so in fact, uh, most of those uh, ingredients are not um, perishable. Um, so we try to avoid that. So did the quality of the data cause any uh, challenges? Yes. Um, yeah, so especially for the, for example, for Timor Leste, um, for those applications, um, you know, data is really a an, 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 an problem and also the, the quality of data. I already uh, mentioned, um, for example, the uh, digital roadmap uh, uh, network. Uh, that's a uh, big issue uh, there, uh, but also uh, data about the, the population. Um, for example, for the digital road network, um, yeah, what we did is uh, we, uh, we combined uh, a road network and then digital uh, two digital road networks, but still, um, you know, it's an issue because not 
all the roads are uh, there. Uh, so that is really an issue and uh, much time is spent uh, uh, on that. And in other applications, um, um, for example, what we did is we tried to get more data on where the roads are by uh, giving trucks a GPS and they are sending a signal every 10 seconds. And by receiving that signal, uh, we can also then uh, trace where are the roads. Uh, does potential hospital location call for a previous optimization problem? For a previous uh, optimization problem, quadratic perhaps? Um, oh, I think I don't understand that uh, question. Um, for a previous optimization problem. Okay, so maybe you can uh, explain in another, uh, you can explain what you exactly uh, mean by that. Are the hospitals modeled as being identical? Or, oh no, I, um, are they, uh, okay, I now don't see that. I think the question was about, are they identical or not? Um, yeah, so in fact, uh, now, uh, up to now, we modeled them as, as identical, um, but, um, you know, um, again, we are still starting this uh, this uh, this toolbox, and so we will certainly extend it also uh, um, to cases to the model where it is not identical, uh, but up to now they are indeed identical. Are there any uncertainties in your model? Um, so for the Timor-Leste, for the um, um, let's say the TPPP uh, model. Uh, not yet for the uh, World Food Program. Um, so in Optimus, uh, that is not included uh, uncertainty. Uh, but uh, recently we developed a an, um, an, uh, robust version of the model that I explained for the World Food Program, where we applied um, robust optimization and also adaptive robust optimization ever, uh, for the uh, World Food uh, Programming model. But um, the model that is uh, used by a World Food Program nowadays, uh, there is no uh, robust optimization uh, uh, included. Um, and let me see. Um, we probably have time for just one more question. One more question. Okay. Um, let me see. Um, can you elaborate on how the fact of floods was incorporated into the healthcare center allocation problem? Okay, so it was not included in the um, in the allocation problem. It was a different model, um, but the aim is to in, to combine those two. So the way we do it now is given a budget for um, let us say upgrading the roads, where to. Uh, which road should be upgraded such that um, um, the profit for accessibility to, uh, um, to hospitals is maximized. So that is given the fact that you already know what are the, the healthcare facilities. So after you've done the optimization for the healthcare locations, you do this analysis for uh, respect to floods. And of course, it would be ideal to combine it into one. And in fact, uh, that is also... Uh, yeah, a uh, topic that we are uh, going to look uh, at it in the future. I think I have to stop here, Lindsay. It, perfect timing. And I wanted to take this opportunity to thank Dick once more for this super fascinating webinar. To follow, I know I've seen several questions come in about whether or not we'd be sending out the recording. We absolutely will within the week, along with a PDF of the slides we shared today. So please stay tuned for that. And then also, as we end today's session, please take a minute to complete the survey. It's going to appear right after I end the session. It really helps us build new content for you and improve the academic webinar series. Thanks again. We hope to see you at the next academic web webinar, and we really appreciate your attendance and, Dick, your participation. So thank you all. You're welcome. Bye.